Well, if you've heard me be referred to as Bao or Barbara, so you'll have to come to happy hour to get skinny on that. <laughs> How many of you remember this talk from four years ago? No denying it, because you were there and I was here. And we talked about being stewards, caretakers of our streams. But it was during this talk that we also made the commitment to talk about being caretakers of our watersheds. And above and beyond that, we also talked about bringing in our land developer friends. Remember that? We talked about some of our first few projects, the first one being our Fee and Lou project on Lemon Gulch in the town of Parker an opportunity to work with our first land developer to integrate the development with the stream restoration. This project was completed as of earlier this year, and thanks to the efforts of Kurt Bauer, Richard Borchert, and the town of Parker, it was a success. The development did integrate the restoration as part of the project, but also allocated more space to Lemon Gulch. And we've had such a great season for moisture that the site looks great. We also talked about this project, Cherry Creek, in Douglas County. Another opportunity to work with the developer to engage the creek. And in this case, it was about reconnecting Cherry Creek to its historic floodplain. And again, through the leadership of Douglas County, we were successful. This was really just a mere few years ago. And look what you guys have accomplished. We've got $112 million worth of fee and lieu projects in the pipelines. Several in Adams, in Denver, in Jefferson County, and many more in Douglas County. And these are projects that we design and build on behalf of the developers for the benefit of the community. But we also review projects through our maintenance eligibility program. And this graphic just simply shows the number of submittals monthly that we review. All I want you to know is the difference in color between the light blue and all the other colors. We are busy. You guys are busy. The number of submittals that we have received monthly this year has doubled to what it was last year. But I take that as a celebration of our successes in that the outreach, the engagement that Laura spoke to earlier in the day to kind of bridge with folks that are different from us is working. We are connecting with the development community and they are bringing their projects to our table. But it's not been an easy journey and we like to talk about what's worked and what hasn't worked well. So I just want to share with you a few snippets of things that we've learned along the way, and I'm sure there's a lot others here that I haven't captured and hope to hear from you on those. We heard about early in a lot of the discussions today, getting in early. We heard that with the panel today. That's very true with working with land development, and we've learned that head on. They want to know very early on the impacts to money, land, and time. And if you can't give that to them, at least give them a sense of certainty in the process when you'll be able to talk through impacts to land, money, and time. But the others are pretty normal to what we've heard already this morning. Topics tied to collaboration. Even on this front, it comes down to relationships. It may not be founded on trust, it may be founded on the fact that we can get the job done, our competency. It can, may be founded on the fact that we actually have contractors to get the work done, but having the relationship with the development community allows us to have an open, curious, and inquisitive conversation that pulls the team together. And lastly, in regards to lessons learned, we're still working on this front, and with Mary Powell on our team now, I think we'll be able to navigate it. But establishment on any project is really tough, but more so on fee and loop projects. Knowing what we mean by establishment and knowing when we're transitioning from establishment over to operations. But I just want to take a moment here really to recognize the accomplishments of really all of you. I don't want this to be about the flood district. 
You know, when we talked about this four years ago, I think it was a pie in the sky idea. But there were a few of you that stepped up to say, we're willing to kind of give this a test drive, this fee and lieu concept, and see if we can get traction. And I want to recognize those that were on the front lines with us today. And so I'm going to call on your agency. And if you're with that agency, if you could just please stand to be recognized and stay standing until I've recognized all of you. Folks with Denver, please stand and stay standing. Don't be shy. Parker. Douglas County. Castle Pines. Lone Tree. Jefferson County. Lakewood. And Thornton. These are the folks that were at the front line with us giving this process a try, and look what you have done for us. We are making a difference. Let's get these folks a hand of applause. But our work isn't done. We've just started. And as Laura spoke to earlier this morning with project partners on how the idea of evolving a way of delivering a project shifted our culture, this is not about the district reviewing projects or designing and building projects. This is about the district building a true partnership with development and being a staple in the industry to shape that culture so that we can find commonality to build something that matters to them and to us. We want developers to want us. We don't want them to need us. We want them to want us at the table. Laura spoke to the different buckets for partnership, the first one being value. We want to be seen as a value to our development friends. Not that they have to, but because they want to, not because we can coordinate things on their behalf, because we truly are adding value, whether it's with reducing costs, our expertise, project delivery, or getting through permits. That is what our development services program is about. But it starts here. It starts with working on us. And so the first thing that we've done this year to kick off this service area is to really understand you, our local governments, how you do business with development. What we want to take from that is then to align how we do business with you so that when a developer comes and docks at your door, it's seamless to them how you and us work together through the entitlement process. That is our goal for this year and for next. Because there's a lot of areas left in the district, shown here in black, that's either developing or developable. So our work isn't done from our conversation four years ago. And you might be wondering, well, why? Well, let's, let's talk through the why a little bit here. Whatever that inspiration point is that you have, let's talk through that and explore that. But I'm going to revisit the commitment we, we, we talked about four years ago, and I'm going to step it up one step. I think that there are certain experiences that shape us as kids, right? There are memories that shape us. And this is a classic photo when I see myself. I can feel the emotions that's going through me. And I'm not happy, if you can't tell. So you might want to look for this expression in some of our meetings to get a telltale sign of how I'm feeling. <laughs> but let's take a moment and go remember what are those things that are most vivid to us growing up. For me, it's tied to the outdoors. And it's because of my time in California. My parents were farmers for a period of time. We grew tomatoes, squashes, zucchinis. We even picked from orchards. Peaches are worth picking. Searches are worth picking. Don't go for raspberries. It takes forever to fill that fruit pin pint. But because of farming, I learned about the outdoors through Lost Lake. It was a great way to start the day. It was a great day to end the day. I nearly drowned, and I finally learned how to swim. But it provided that safe introduction to the outdoors that it became a part of my mainstay growing up. I walked to school, rain or shine. Raise your hand if you did that. Keep your hands raised if you use the sun as your clock or the moon. 
How many of you probably walked miles, like 20 miles beyond your house growing up? And climbed just about everything and played with everything. The one thing that I enjoyed the most growing up was playing on railroad tracks. Can you guys relate? It was a long, infinite balance beam, but the funnest part was to put rocks or coins on the track to see what would, what would happen to it when the train came by. Not a good idea, but it's fun. <laughs> now let's explore what kind of memories our kids have, or grandkids, or nieces or nephews, right? Let's talk about mine. My kids don't know a life before technology. They don't know a life before the cell phone, right? I think they actually date their lives based on when the iPhone came out. My youngest first word was actually Apple. Yay! She said Apple. <laughs> the Apple iPhone, right? Seriously. And even at the age of nine, technology is still her friend. She managed to take a panorama shot and capture herself in every shot in this panoramic view. Amazing, but also scary. She sees the world only through technology. And then we had the pandemic. And the silver lining with the pandemic is that we rediscovered the outdoors. My kids did as well. And I think the studies and data shows that we've spent 20 to 60% more time outdoors. We've got this new sense of appreciation, this newfound appreciation for the outdoors and for nature. We want it in our home. We want it around our houses. I think current studies show that we're willing to trade like an 8,000 square foot lot for a 3,000 square foot lot as long as it's functional. We want it in our neighborhood. We want it in our cities. The days of driving hours to the outdoors, that's yesteryear. And we want it in our workplaces. But I think the most important thing that we've realized through this is that we miss being a community, not only with people, but also with nature. Our value of nature is, is the highest level that it's ever been. And if Adam Bienenstock with Nature Play, Play was here, he'd say, duh. Nature is therapeutic. Now you're on this trail walking. You can feel the shade. You can feel the heat. You can smell the earth. You can hear the water of the creek next to you, and you can see the texture. It's calming, it brings peace, and it's therapeutic. I was talking to a group of young leaders with the Urban Land Institute recently, and we talked about nature. The word that came across consistently was, it made me feel safe and certain that everything was going to be okay. That's why we need nature. And so, Let's leverage this opportunity, right? This opportunity that the pandemic has given us, where nature is something that is desired, but I think more importantly, especially on the development side, it's marketable. People are actually willing to pay for it. We've done it, guys. We've done it on our own projects. We have made things better. We've evolved the practices in how we build our waterways to become higher function and lower maintenance. And why did we do that? Because we recognize that we want the benefits of nature in our cities. We, we, yes, we want the convenience of commuting to places, but we want nature to be there with us to provide that serenity. And so I would say to message what you've heard this morning, especially what Dave brought home, is I'm not asking you to be stewards and caretakers of streams anymore. I'm actually now asking you to be the caretaker of the watershed. And why? For all the same reasons we did it with streams. We want the benefits of this in our neighborhoods. We want to provide our kids a safe experience to the outdoors so that we can create stewards and caretakers out of them. And I'm going to speak to this project again. I spoke to it four years ago, and you've heard it a million times since then. And yes, you're going to hear it one more time today. This was our pilot project working with the town of Parker to employ step one and step two at a watershed scale, the Oak Gulch project. And if you don't remember, this is a project that it was just a desktop exercise. We took a piece of land and worked with a development team, not a real developer, and just said, could we lay out this land 
to employ step one and step two. First, we laid it out the way that development's typically laid out. You lay out the roads first and everything goes around it. And in this case, you lose a lot of your first and second order streams, so you end up with just the main stem. Then we said, well, why don't we balance roads with streams as well as housing unit and see what we come up with, and this is what we came up with. And through that exercise, we realized this is possible. Well, a couple years ago, a developer actually came in and they're developing this piece of land, and this is what their layout looks like. It looks very similar to the roadmap that we put in place. And not only with this development do you have the main stem that's intact, yes, we've got that, and yes, we've got the corridor and the open space adjacent to it, but we also have the fingers of the stream. We have the entire stream network. We have the first order and second order streams, which provides what helps with step one, runoff reduction. And beyond that, what we learned is, well, guess what? Now we have this network of streams, which is also a network of trails, which now connects your pocket parks to your neighborhood parks to your regional parks. So from an open space and park programming standpoint, it also works. And what we're learning through this project, and again, proof of concept is coming when construction goes in 2022, but we're learning that this approach is actually less than what the developer had budgeted if he had gone the traditional route. So we'll report more on this because this is, can be a roadmap for us on how to be stewards of our watersheds and employing steps one and two at a watershed scale safely um, with our developer friends. And so this is where I want us to make a new commitment. As you leave today's symposium, go back to your office on your project, with your team, with your organization, with your neighbors, and make sure that every project that you do, and I think there was a quote that um, Jeff put up there, is see every project as that chance. Every project makes a difference, and build better. And if not for yourself, think about the kids that we're raising, our kids, your nieces, your nephews, your grandkids, but our children, as the sole caretaker of life, as Laura referred to earlier, no one's looking out for the streams in the watershed. This group is, and it's our responsibility to make sure that we give all kids the same safe experiences with the outdoors. And with that, I'd say thank you.